Hello everyone, I'm Anne Haddad, historian at the Merchant's House Museum. Welcome to our series, Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. For background information about the purpose and theme of this series, please stay tuned after the story. Today's story, My Contraband, was written by the one author in our series whose work you are most likely very familiar with, Louisa May Alcott. Although best known for her series of novels written for girls, such as Little Women, Alcott, who was born in 1832, also wrote gothic thrillers under a pseudonym and other short fiction. My Contraband, which appeared originally as The Brothers, in the Atlantic Monthly in November of 1863, was drawn from Louisa's experiences as a Civil War nurse in Georgetown one year prior. She used her writing to defy the conventional view of women's role in society. She died in 1888. The term contraband was used by the United States military to describe enslaved people who escaped their enslavers and sought protection behind Union lines during the Civil War. The 54th, referred to in the story, was the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, one of the first major American military regiments made up of African Americans. The story of the unit and its heroics during the Battle of Fort Wagner were depicted in the film Glory. Owing to its length and our time constraints, I have edited this story, but I trust that it will not affect the impact of Louise's compelling narrative. And the dialogue of the enslaved characters was written to represent the sound of their speech, which Louisa herself admitted was a great challenge. I have tried to portray them with sensitivity. Dr. Frank came in as I sat sewing up the rents in an old shirt that Tom might go tidily to his grave. New shirts were needed for the living and there was no wife or mother to dress him. Miss Dane, began the doctor, a reb has just been brought in crazy with typhoid, a bad case every way, a drunken rascally little captain, somebody took the trouble to capture, but whom nobody wants to take the trouble to cure. 
The wards are full, the ladies worked to death and willing to be for our own boys, but rather slow to risk their lives for a red. Now you've had the fever and I will find you a good attendant. The fellow won't last long, I fancy, but he can't die without some sort of care, you know. I've put him in the fourth story of the West Wing away from the rest. Now then, will you go? Of course I will, out of perversity, if not common charity. For some of these people think that because I'm an abolitionist, I am also a heathen. And I should rather like to show them that, though I cannot quite love my enemies, I am very willing to take care of them. Very good. And speaking of abolition reminds me that you can have a contraband for servant if you like. It is that fine mulatto fellow who was found burying his rebel master after the fight and being badly cut over the head. Our boys brought him along. Will you have him? Oh, by all means, these black boys are far more faithful and handy than some of the white scamps given me to serve instead of being served by. But is this man well enough? Yes, for that sort of work, and I think you'll like him. He must have been a handsome fellow before he got his face slashed, not much darker than myself, his master's son, I dare say, and the white blood makes him rather high and haughty about some things. He was in a bad way when they came in, but vowed he'd die in the street rather than turn in with the black fellows below. So I put him up in the West Wing to be out of the way, and he seen to the captain all morning. When can you go up? In an hour, I took possession of my new charge, finding a dissipated looking boy of 19 or 20 raving in the solitary little room with no one near him but the contraband in the room adjoining. Feeling decidedly more interest in the black man than in the white, I glanced furtively at him as I scattered chloride of lime about the room to purify the air and settled matters to suit myself. I had seen many contrabands, but never one so attractive as this. This boy was five and 20 at least, strong limbed and manly, and he had the look of one who never had been cowed by abuse or worn with oppressive labor. He sat on his bed doing nothing. Yet anything less indolent or listless than his attitude and expression I never saw. Erect he sat with a hand on either knee and eyes fixed on the bare wall opposite. So wrapped in some absorbing thought as to be unconscious of my presence, though the door stood wide open and my movements were by no means noiseless. His face was half averted, but I instantly approved the doctor's taste, for the profile which I saw possessed all the attributes of comeliness belonging to his mixed race. What could he be thinking of? The sick boy cursed and raved, I rustled to and fro, steps passed the door, bells rang, and the steady rumble of army wagons came up from the street. Still, he never stirred. I wondered if it were some deep wrong or sorrow kept alive by memory and regret. If he mourned perhaps for the dead master to whom he had been faithful to the end. Or if the liberty now his was robbed of half its sweetness by the knowledge that someone near and dear to him still languished in the hell from which he had escaped. My heart quite warmed to him at that idea. I wanted to know and comfort him. And following the impulse of the moment, I went in and touched him on the shoulder. In an instant, the man vanished and the slave appeared. Freedom was too new a boon to have wrought its blessed changes yet. And as he started up with his hand at his temple, and an obsequious, yes, missus. Any romance that had gathered round him fled away, 
leaving the saddest of all sad facts in living guise before me. Not only did the manhood seem to die out of him, but the comeliness that first attracted me. For as he turned, I saw the ghastly wound that had laid open cheek and forehead. Being partly healed, it was no longer bandaged, but held together with strips of transparent plaster. Part of his black hair had been shorn away and one eye was nearly closed and the cruel saber cut marred that portion of his face. My purpose was suddenly changed and though I went in to offer comfort as a friend, I merely gave an order as a mistress. Will you open these windows? This man needs more air. He obeyed at once and as he slowly urged up the unruly sash, the handsome profile was again turned towards me. And again, I was possessed by my first impression so strongly that I involuntarily said, thank you. Perhaps it was fancy, but I thought that in that look of mingled surprise and something like reproach, which he gave me, there was also a trace of grateful pleasure. But he said, in that tone of spiritless humility, these poor souls learned so soon. Eyes in a white man, miss, is eyes a contraband. Yes, I know it, but a contraband is a free man, and I heartily congratulate you. He liked that. His face shone, he squared his shoulders, lifted his head, and looked me full in the eye with a brisk, Thank you, Mrs. Anything more to do for you? Dr. Frank thought you would help me with this man as there are many patients and few nurses or attendants. Have you had the fever? No, Mrs. They should have thought of that when they put him here. Wounds and fever should not be together. I will try to get you moved. He laughed a sudden laugh. It don't matter, Mrs. I'd rather be up here with the fever than down there, and there isn't no other place for me. Poor fellow, that was true. No ward in all the hospital would take him to lie side by side with the most miserable white wreck there. You shall stay then, but are you well and strong enough? I guess I'll do, Mrs. He spoke with a passive sort of acquiescence as if it did not much matter if he were not able. Yes, I think you will. By what name shall I call you? Bob, Mrs. Every woman has her pet whim. One of mine was to teach the men self-respect by treating them respectfully. What is your other name? I asked. I like to call my attendants by their last names rather than by their first. I's got no other, missus. We had our master's names or do without. Mine's dead and I won't have anything of his about me. Well, I shall call you Robert then, and you may fill this pitcher for me, if you will be so kind. He went, but through all the tame obedience years of servitude had taught him, I could see that his proud spirit was not yet subdued for the look and gesture with which he repudiated his master's name were a more effective declaration of independence than any 4th of July orator could have prepared. We spent a curious week together. Robert seldom left his room except upon my errands, and I was a prisoner all day, often all night, by the bedside of the rebel. The fever burned itself rapidly away, for there seemed little vitality to feed it in the feeble frame of this old young man, whose life had been none of the most righteous, judging from the revelations made by his unconscious lips. And more than once, Robert silenced him when blasphemous wanderings or ribald camp songs made my cheeks burn and Robert's face assume an aspect of disgust. The captain was a gentleman in the world's eye, but the contraband was the gentleman in mine. I never asked Robert of himself, feeling that somewhere 
there was a spot still too sore to bear the lightest touch. But from his language, manner, and intelligence, I inferred that his color had procured for him the few advantages within the reach of a quick-witted, kindly treated slave. Silent, brave, and thoughtful, but most serviceable was my contraband. Glad of the books I brought him, faithful in the performance of the duties I assigned to him, grateful for the friendliness I could not but feel and show toward him. Often I longed to ask what purpose was so visibly altering his aspect with such daily deepening gloom, but I never dared. On the seventh night, Dr. Frank suggested that it would be well for someone besides the general watchman of the ward to be with the captain as it might be his last. Of course, I offered to remain. Give him water as long as he can drink, and if he drops into a natural sleep, it may save him. I look in at midnight when some change will probably take place. Nothing but sleep or a miracle will keep him now. Away went the doctor, and I lowered my lamp, wet the captain's head, and sat down on a hard stool to begin my watch. The captain lay with his hot, haggard face turned toward me, filling the air with his poisonous breath and feebly muttering, with lips and tongue so parched that the sanest speech would have been difficult to understand. Robert was stretched on his bed in the inner room, the door of which stood ajar, and having little else to do just then, I fell to thinking of this curious contraband who evidently prized his freedom highly, yet seemed in no haste to enjoy it. Dr. Frank had just offered to send him on to safer quarters, but he had said, no, thank you, sir, not yet. And then had gone away to fall into one of those black moods of his, which began to disturb me because I had no power to lighten them. As I sat listening to the clocks from the steeples all about us, I amused myself with planning Robert's future as I often did my own, when a harsh, choked voice called, Lucy. It was the captain, and some new terror seemed to have gifted him with momentary strength. Yes, yes, here's Lucy, I answered hoping that by following the fancy I might quiet him, for his face was damp with clammy moisture and his frame shaken with the nervous tremor that so often precedes death. His dull eye fixed upon me, dilating with a bewildered look of incredulity and wrath, till he broke out fiercely, That's a lie! She's dead and so's Bob! Damn him! Finding speech a failure, I began to sing a quiet tune that had often soothed delirium like this, when he clutched me by the wrist, whispering like one in mortal fear, Hush, hush, she used to sing that way to Bob, but she never would to me. I swore I'd whip the devil out of her, and I did, but you know before she cut her throat, she said she'd haunt me, and there she is pointed behind me with an aspect of such pale dismay that I involuntarily glanced over my shoulder and started as if I had seen a veritable ghost. For peering from the gloom of that inner room, I saw a shadowy face. An instant, though, showed me that it was only Robert leaning from his bed's foot. But what a strange expression on his face. The unmarred side was toward me, fixed and motionless as when I first observed it. His eyes glittered, his lips were apart like one who listened with every sense, and his whole aspect reminded me of a hound to which some wind had brought the scent of unsuspected prey. Do you know him, Robert? Does, does he mean you? Laws, no, missus, 
They all own half a dozen bobs, but here in my name woke me, that's all. He spoke quite naturally and lay down again while I returned to my charge, thinking that this paroxysm was probably his last. But by another hour, I perceived a hopeful change, for the tremor had subsided, his breathing was more regular, and sleep the healer had descended to save or take him gently away. Dr. Frank looked in at midnight, bade me keep all cool and quiet, and not fail to administer a certain draft as soon as the captain woke. Very much relieved, I laid my head on my arms, uncomfortably folded on the little table, and drowsily resolving to look up again in 15 minutes, I fell fast asleep. The striking of a deep voice clock awoke me with a start. Oh, that is one, thought I, but to my dismay, two more strokes followed, and in remorseful haste, I sprang up to see what harm my long oblivion had done. When a strong hand put me back into my seat and held me there, it was Robert. The instant my eye met his, my heart began to beat, and all along my nerves tingled that electric flash which foretells a danger that we cannot see. He was very pale his mouth grim and both eyes full of somber fire. For even the wounded one was open now and all the more sinister for the deep scar above and below. But his touch was steady, his voice quiet as he said, sit still, missus. I won't hurt you nor scare you if I can help it, but you're wake too soon. Let me go, Robert. The captain is stirring. I must give him something. I... No, missus, you can't stir an inch. Look here. Holding me with one hand, with the other he took up the glass in which I had left the draft and showed me it was empty. Has he taken it? I asked, more and more bewildered. I flung it out of the window, missus. He'll have to do without. But why, Robert? Why did you do it? Because I hate him. Impossible to doubt the truth of that. His whole face showed it as he spoke through his set teeth and launched a fiery glance at the unconscious captain. I could only hold my breath and stare blankly at him, wondering what mad act was coming next. I suppose I shook and turned white as women have a foolish habit of doing, for Robert released my arm, sat down upon the bedside just in front of me, and said with the ominous quietude that made me cold to see and hear. Don't you be frightened, missus. Don't try to run away, for the door is locked and the key in my pocket. And don't you be crying out for you'd have to scream a long while with my hand on your mouth before you was heard. Be still and I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I, I will be still and hear you, but open the window, please. Why did you shut it? I'm sorry, I can't do it, missus, but you'd jump out or call if I did and I ain't ready yet. I shut it to make you sleep and heat would do it quicker than anything else I could do. The captain moved and feebly muttered, water. Instinctively, I rose to give it to him, but the heavy hand came down upon my shoulder and in the same decided tone, Robert said, the water went with the physic, let him call. Oh, do let me go to him, he'll die without care. I mean he shall. Don't you meddle if you please, missus. In spite of his quiet tone and respectful manner, I saw murder in his eyes and turned faint with fear. And hardly knowing what I did, I seized the hands that had seized me, crying, No, no, please, you shall not kill him. It is base to hurt a helpless man. Why do you hate him? He is not your master. He's my brother. 
I felt that answer from head to foot and seemed to fathom what was coming. One appeal was left to me and I made it. Robert, tell me what it means. Do not commit a crime and make me accessory to it. There is a better way of righting wrong than by violence. Let me help you to find it. My voice trembled as I spoke and I heard the frightened flutter of my heart. So did he. And if any little act of mine had ever won affection or respect from him, the memory of it served me then. He looked down and seemed to put some question to himself. Whatever it was, the answer was in my favor. For when his eyes rose again, they were gloomy, but not desperate. I will tell you, Mrs. But mine, this makes no difference. The boy is mine. I'll give the Lord a chance to take him first. If he don't, I shall. Oh no, remember he is your brother. That was an unwise speech for a black frown gathered on Robert's face and his strong hands closed with an ugly sort of grip. But he did not touch the poor soul gasping there behind him and seemed content to let the slow suffocation of that stifling room end his frail life. I'm not like to forget that, missus, when I've been thinking of it all this week. I knew him when they fetched him in and I would have done it long for this, but I wanted to ask where Lucy was. He knows, he told tonight, and now he's done for. Who is Lucy? I asked hurriedly, intent on keeping his mind busy with any thought but murder. He was no longer slave or contraband. No drop of black blood marred him in my sight but an infinite compassion yearned to save, to help, to comfort him. Words seemed so powerless, I offered none, only put my hand on his poor head, pitifully wondering where was the wife who must have loved this tender-hearted man so well. The captain moaned again and faintly whispered, eh, eh. but I never stirred. God forgive me. Just then, I hated him as only a woman thinking of a sister woman's wrong could hate. Robert looked up. I said, tell me more. And he did. You see, Mrs. his father, I, I might say as if I wasn't ashamed of both of them. His father died two years ago and left us all to Master Ned. That's him here, 18 then. He always hated me. I look so like old master. He don't. Old master was kind to all of us, me especially, and bought Lucy off the next plantation down there in South Carolina when he found I liked her. I, I married her. It weren't much, but we was true to one another till master Ned come home a year after and made hell for both of us. He sent my old mother to be used up in his rice swamp in Georgia. He found me with my pretty Lucy, and though young miss cried and cried, and I prayed to him on my knees, and Lucy ran away, he wouldn't have no mercy. He brought her back, and he, he took her. Oh, what did you do? How the man's outraged heart sent the blood flaming up into his face and deepened the tones of his impetuous voice as he stretched his arm across the bed saying, I half murdered him and tonight I'll finish. Yes, yes, but, but what came next? They whipped me till I couldn't stand and then they sold me further south. Look here. With the sudden wrench, he tore the shirt from neck to waist and on his strong brown shoulders showed me furrows deeply plowed, wounds which, though healed, were ghastlier to me than any in that house. Then, with the pathetic dignity a great grief lends the humblest sufferer, he ended his brief tragedy by simply saying, That's all, Mrs. I've never seen her since, and now I never shall in this world. 
maybe not into other. But Robert, why think her dead? The captain was wondering when he said those sad things. Perhaps he will retract them when he is sane. No, missus, I spect he's right. She was too proud to bear that long. It's like her to kill herself. I told her to, if there was no other way. And she always minded me, Lucy did. My poor girl. Oh, it weren't right. No, by God, it weren't. As the memory of this bitter wrong, this double bereavement burned in his sore heart, the devil that lurks in every strong man's blood leaped up. He put his hand upon his brother's throat and watching the white face before him, muttered low between his teeth, I'm letting him go too easy. There's no pain in this. We ain't even yet. Master Ned, it's Bob. Where's Lucy? From the captain's lips, there came a long, faint sigh and nothing but a flutter of the eyelids showed that he still lived. A strange stillness filled the room as the elder brother held the younger's life suspended in his hand while wavering between a dim hope and a deadly hate. I knew I must prevent murder if I could, but how? What could I do up there alone, locked in with a dying man and a lunatic? But one weapon I possessed, a tongue, often a woman's best defense, and sympathy gave me power to use it. What I said, heaven only knows, but surely heaven helped me, and some good angel prompted me to use the one name that had power to arrest my hearer's hand and touch his heart. For at that moment, I heartily believed that Lucy lived and this earnest faith roused in him like a belief. He listened with the look of one in whom brute instinct was sovereign for the time. He was but a man, a poor, untaught, outcast, outraged man. Life had few joys for him. The world offered him no honors, no success, no home, no love. What future could this crime mar? And why should he deny himself that sweet yet bitter morsel called revenge? Should I have reproached him for a human anguish, a human longing, all now left him from the ruin of his few poor hopes? Who had taught him that self-control, self-sacrifice are attributes that make men masters of the earth and lift them nearer heaven? He had no religion, for he was no saintly Uncle Tom, and slavery's black shadow seemed to darken all the world to him and shut out God. Should I have tried to touch him by appeals to filial duty, to brotherly love? No. But instinct showed me the one safe clue by which to lead this troubled soul from the labyrinth in which it groped and nearly fell. Robert turned to me, asking, Do you believe if I let Marston Ned live, the Lord will give me back my Lucy? As surely as there is a Lord, you will find her here or in the beautiful hereafter where there is no black or white, no master and no slave. He took his hands from his brother's throat and like a blind man who believes there is a sun yet cannot see it, he shook his head, let his arms drop upon his knees and sat there dumbly asking that question which many a soul whose faith is firmer fixed than his had asked in hours. Where is God? I saw the tide had turned and strenuously tried to keep this rudderless lifeboat from slipping back into the whirlpool wherein it had been so nearly lost. I have listened to you, Robert. Now hear me and heed what I say because my heart is so full of pity for you, full of hope for your future and a desire to help you now. I want you to go away from here, from the temptation of this place, 
and the sad thoughts that haunt it. You have conquered yourself once, but it is safer to put a greater distance between you and this man. I will write you letters, give you money, and send you to Massachusetts to begin your new life a free man and a happy man. For when the captain is himself again, I will learn where Lucy is and move heaven and earth to find and give her back to you. Will you do this, Robert? Slowly, very slowly, the answer came. Yes, Mrs. I will. Good. Now you are the man I thought you, and I'll work for you with all my heart. You need sleep, my poor fellow. Go and try to forget. The captain is alive, and as yet you are spared that sin. I shall care for him. Come, Robert, for Lucy's sake. Thank heaven for the immortality of love, for when all other means of salvation failed, a spark of this vital fire softened the man's iron will until a woman's hand could bend it. He let me take from him the key, let me draw him gently away and lead him to the solitude, which now was the most healing balm I could bestow. Once in his little room, he fell down on his bed and lay there, as if spent with the sharpest conflict of his life. I slipped the bolt across this door and unlocked my own. Then I rushed to Dr. Frank. He came, and till dawn we worked together, saving one brother's life and talking earnestly about how best to secure the other's liberty. When the sun came up, the doctor went to Robert. For an hour, I heard the murmur of their voices. Once, I caught the sound of heavy sobs, and for a time, a reverent hush, as if in the silence, that good man were ministering to soul as well as body. When he departed, he took Robert with him, pausing to tell me he should get him off as soon as possible. Nothing more was seen of them all day. I tried to rest, but could not, with the thought of poor Lucy tugging at my heart, and I was soon back at my post again. Just as night fell, there came a tap, and opening, I saw Robert. The doctor had replaced the ragged suit with tidy garments, and no trace of that tempestuous night remained, but deeper lines upon the forehead, and the docile look of a repentant child. He did not cross the threshold, did not offer me his hand, only took off his cap, saying with a falter in his voice, I'm going. I put out both my hands and held his fast. Goodbye, Robert, keep up good heart. And when I come home to Massachusetts, we'll meet in a happier place than this. Now, are you quite ready for your journey? Yes, Mrs. The doctor's fixed everything. I's going with a friend of his. My papers are all right, and I'm as happy as I can be till I find. He stopped there, then went on with a glance into the room. I'm glad I didn't do it, and I thank your hearty missus for hindering me, but I'm afraid I hate him just the same. Of course he did, and so did I for these faulty hearts of ours cannot turn perfect in a night. Wishing to divert his mind, I put my poor little mite into his hand, and remembering the magic of a certain little book, I gave him mine, on whose dark cover whitely shone the virgin mother and the child. The money went into Robert's pocket with a grateful murmur, the book into his bosom with a long look and a tremulous I never saw my baby, Mrs. I broke down then, and though my eyes were too dim to see, I felt the touch of lips upon my hands, heard the sound of departing feet, and knew my contraband was gone. When one feels an intense dislike, the less one says about the subject of it, the better. Therefore, I shall merely record that the captain lived and in time was exchanged and that whoever the other party was, 
I am convinced the government got the best of the bargain. But long before this occurred, I had fulfilled my promise to Robert, for as soon as my patient recovered strength of memory enough to make his answer trustworthy, I asked, Captain Fairfax, where is Lucy? And too feeble to be angry, surprised, or insincere, he straightway answered, Dead, Miss Dane. And she killed herself after you sold Bob? How the devil did you know that? He muttered with an expression half remorseful, half amazed. But I was satisfied and said no more. Of course, this news went to Robert, waiting far away there in a lonely home, waiting, working, hoping for his Lucy. It almost broke my heart to do it, but delay was weak, so I sent the heavy tidings, and very soon the answer came. Only three lines, but I felt that the sustaining power of the man's life was gone. I told I'd never see her anymore. I'm glad to know she's out of trouble. I thank you, missus, and if they let us, I'll fight for you till I'm killed, which I hope will be for long. Six months later, he had his wish and kept his word. Now everyone knows the story of the attack on Fort Wagner. The future must show how well that fight was fought and the manhood of the colored race shines before many eyes that would not see, rings in many ears that would not hear, wins many hearts that would not hitherto believe. When the news came that we were needed, there was none so glad as I to go to nurse our boys as my dusky flock so proudly called the wounded of the 54th. I fell to work in hospital number 10 at Buford, South Carolina. The scene was most familiar and yet strange for only dark faces looked up at me from the pallets so thickly laid along the floor. And I missed the sharp accent of my Yankee boys in the slower, softer voices calling cheerily to one another or answering my questions with the stout, we'll never give it up, missus, till the last Reb's dead, or if our people's free, we can't afford to die. Passing from bed to bed, intent on making one pair of hands do the work of three, I gradually washed, fed, and bandaged my way down the long line of sable heroes, and coming to the very last, found that he was my contraband. So old though, so worn, so deathly weak and wan, I never should have known him but for the deep scar on his cheek. But even then I doubted as such an awful change had come upon him. When turning to the ticket just above his head, I saw the name Robert Dane. That both assured and touched me for remembering that he had had no name, I knew that he had taken mine. I longed for him to speak to me, to tell how he had fared since I lost sight of him, and let me perform some little service for him in return for many he had done for me. But he seemed asleep, and as I stood reliving that strange night again, a bright lad who lay next to him softly waving an old fan across both beds, looked up and said, I guess you know him, missus? You are right. Do you? As much as anyone was able to, missus. Why do you say was as if the man were dead and gone? I suppose because I know he'll have to go. He's got a bad jab in the breast and is bleeding inside, the doctor says. He don't suffer any. He only gets weaker and weaker every minute. I've been fanning him this long while and he's talked a little, but he don't know me now. So he's most gone, I guess. There was so much sorrow and affection in the boy's face. And then I remembered something and asked with redoubled interest, are you the one that brought him off? I was told about a boy who nearly lost his life in saving that of his mate. 
I dare say the young fellow blushed as any modest lad might have done. I heard the chuckle of satisfaction that escaped him as he glanced from his shattered arm and bandaged side to the pale figure opposite. Oh, Lord, missus, that's nothing. We boys always stand by one another, and I weren't going to leave him to be tormented any more by them cussed ribs. The dark freeman looked at the white slave with the pitiful yet puzzled expression I have often seen on the faces of our wisest men when this tangled question of slavery presented itself, asking to be cut or patiently undone. Tell me what you know of this man. He was a shut up sort of fellow and didn't seem to care for anything but getting at the ribs. He fretted till we were off. And when we pitched into old Wagner, he fought like the devil. Were you with him when he was wounded? Yes, missus. There was something queer about it, for he appeared to know the chap that killed him, and the chap knew him. I guess one owned the other sometime, for when they clinched, the chap sung out, Bob! And Dane said, Master Ned! And then they went at it. I sat down suddenly, for the old anger and compassion struggled in my heart, and I both longed and feared to hear what was to follow. I was just behind, and the whole thing happened in a minute. Just where we were, some sort of an officer was waving his sword and cheering on his men. Dane saw him. He flung away his gun, gave a leap, and went after that feller as if he were Jeff Beauregard and Lee all in one. I scrabbled after as quick as I could, but was only up in time to see him get the sword straight through him and drop into the ditch. Uh, you needn't ask what I did next, missus, for I don't quite know myself. All I'm clear about is that I managed somehow to pitch that reb into the fort as dead as Moses, get hold of Dane and bring him off. Poor old fella. We said we went in to live or die. He said he went in to die and he's done it. I had been intently watching the excited speaker, but as he regretfully added those last words, I turned again and Robert's eyes met mine. He knew me, yet he gave no greeting, was glad to see a woman's face, yet had no smile wherewith to welcome it. Felt that he was dying, yet uttered no farewell. He was too far across the river to return or linger now. Departing thought, strength, breath were spent in one grateful look, one murmur of submission to the last pang he could ever feel. His lips moved, and bending to them, a whisper chilled my cheek as it shaped the broken words. I'd have done it, but it's better so. I'm satisfied. Ah, well, he might be. For as he turned his face from the shadow of the life that was, the sunshine of the life to be touched it with a beautiful contempt. And in the drawing of a breath, my contraband found wife and home, eternal liberty and God. Much to discuss in this story, but a powerful story. Please make note of your questions and comments and join us on April 8th at 6 p.m. for our discussion and Q&A with Elaine Showalter. Please go to www.merchantshouse.org slash calendar to register for this free event. Next Sunday, we will continue our series with a short story by Kate Chopin. I do hope you join me. Thank you so much for listening and until next time. Hello everyone. My name is Annie Haddad and I am the historian at the Merchant's House Museum. 
It is my great pleasure in honor of Women's History Month to welcome you to our new series, Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. In this series of short stories, we will explore how women writers of this period give voice to the pressing issues that were facing women by pulling back the curtains that shrouded their lives to reveal the harsh realities of life in the home and in American society. Defying convention by invading the traditional masculine domain of literature, these writers use their narratives to lay bare the pervasive marginalization of women who were restricted by what was called the cult of true womanhood, of which the prized virtues were piety, submissiveness, domesticity, and purity. They also boldly raised questions about racism and prejudice within the society. While being told to suffer in silence and given constant reminders of their imposed inferiority, many women felt trapped and unfulfilled and hungered for recognition of their plight. As a result, these female writers were critical and commercial successes, despite the largely dismissive attitude of writers and critics. For example, in 1855, a resentful Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote to his publisher, America is now wholly given over to a damned mob of scribbling women and I should have no chance of success while the public is occupied with their trash. Many of these innovative feminist themed stories appeared in the popular periodicals of the day, such as Godey's Ladies Book, Peterson's, and the Atlantic Monthly, and in popular gift books and literary annuals, where they were probably read by the Treadwell women who occupied the home on 4th Street that today we know as the Merchant's House Museum. Since the letters in the museum archives provide little information about the inner lives of Eliza Treadwell and her six daughters, we may read these stories and wonder whether or not they shared the experiences and thoughts expressed within them. Now, after being largely excluded from the American literary canon for a large part of the 20th century, the rise of women's studies programs and attention to feminist literature led to a renewed appreciation of these authors and their works. The renowned literary and feminist scholar Elaine Showalter edited two of the anthologies from which my story selection was taken. I am thrilled to inform you that on April 8th, Dr. Showalter, Professor Emeritus of Princeton University, will be joining us for a virtual discussion and Q&A. Dr. Showalter has written extensively on the short story form as a tool by which women writers could express the circumstances of women's lives. Her expert insights will surely enliven our discussion. So I do hope you join us for that event. Now you probably have not heard of most of the writers in this series. In that case, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to them. Before we begin our first story, I would like to recite one stanza of a poem by Anne Bradstreet titled Prologue. Considered to be one of the most important early American poets, Bradstreet was the first writer to be published in the North American colonies. A mother of eight, she wrote many poems that addressed her domesticity, her Puritan faith, and her struggles to remain committed to her writing despite the confining role she was assigned to by virtue of her sex. In prologue written in 1650, Bradstreet reflects 
with a mixture of anger and sarcasm on how society rejects the idea that a woman may have creative impulses. I am obnoxious to each carping tongue who says my hand a needle better fits. A poet's pen all scorn I should thus wrong. For such despite they cast on female wits. If I do prove well, it won't advance. They'll say it's stolen or else it was by chance.